you would have thought that with the ending of the first Bioshock game, that we'd have seen the last of Rapture. Rapture has descended into madness, Fontaine and Ryan are gone, the little sisters are free and Jack died of old age. Cool, right? Wrong. Because 2K Marin, with the help of other developers, would create the forgotten middle child of this legendary franchise, Bioshock 2. The reason why I say it's the forgotten middle child is because most people would say that the second entry in this franchise is completely skippable and I understand why. But the game does have its good points and we'll be discussing those and where it falls short in this video. Hey guys, Vamiabra here, welcome back to the channel. In today's video, we'll be discussing Bioshock 2 Remastered and answering the question, is it worth playing in 2023? We'll be talking about the game's story, gameplay, and replayability, and at the end, we'll give our final verdict. Let's hop right into the video and start with its story. You play the game as Subject Delta, an Alpha Series Big Daddy who was paired with a little sister called Eleanor Lamb. The game starts in 1958 with Subject Delta patrolling with Eleanor. As Eleanor playfully moves through Rapture, Delta loses sight of her and soon hears her scream. After rushing to find her, you find a few men trying to kidnap her and you deal with them accordingly. Unfortunately, you're hit with a hypnotized plasmid and made to stand down. It's here where the main antagonist of the game makes herself known, Sophia Lamb, supposed biological mother of Eleanor Lamb. Under the plasmid's effect, Sophia makes you take off your helmet and shoot yourself in the head, effectively killing you. Were you killed? Sadly, yes, but I lived. <laughs> you wake up in front of a Vita chamber in 1968, eight years after the events of the first Bioshock game. In true Bioshock fashion, most of the world building and lore discovery is accessed through map design and audio logs. And the map design really paints a good picture of how Rapture has fallen after the events of Bioshock 1. Voice acting is as good as the last game with a few notable characters from the first game making a reappearance. In the form of audio logs, of course. Soon after waking up, you're contacted by Dr. Tenenbaum, who has returned to Rapture after the frequent disappearances of little girls from the surface. In the first game, it's known that you either rescue or harvest most of the little sisters, and Tenenbaum also brings them with her as she moves to the surface. This means that Lamb has restarted the little sister program, and Tenenbaum came back to stop her. Now, one of the things that bothered me was that I never remembered Sophia Lamb from the first Bioshock game. Through audio logs in Bioshock 2, we know that Ryan, Fontaine, and Lamb were alive before the events of Bioshock 1 and were fighting for political power over Rapture and its people. If she was such a key character, why did she only come to light now, 8 years after Bioshock 1? I know Ryan had her locked up, but shouldn't we have seen her in the first game as we were trying to kill Ryan and Fontaine? This is all just personal preference, of course, but the timing of her rise to power seemed a bit off to me. If you can answer this though, please do put it in the comment sections below. The game takes you on a journey through Rapture to rescue Eleanor Lamb for two main reasons. One, Eleanor Lamb speaks to you telepathically and basically tells you she likes her daddy more than her mommy. And two, if a big daddy stays away from their little sister for too long, the big daddy falls into a coma, experiences uncontrollable fits of rage, or just outright dies. I have to say that the whole experience becomes really intense and emotional by the end of it all, just like in the first game. You meet several key characters who are allies of Sophia Lamb who try to stop you, but once you confront them, you are given a choice to kill them or let them live. You're given context throughout your encounters with them to help you decide whether they deserve to live or not, but do note that these choices will affect the outcome of the story later in the game, in addition to rescuing or harvesting little sisters. More on that in the gameplay section. As a last bit for the story section, this game apparently has six endings. There are good, neutral, and bad types of endings, and each type has two varieties. I got what I think was one of the good endings, and comparing the good ending I got here with the one I got from the first game, they're a little too similar for my taste, which leads us to one of its major flaws. It doesn't really deviate from Bioshock 1's formula story-wise. As I played through Bioshock 2's story, I felt like I was playing an expansion of the first game rather than a sequel. Everything felt too familiar. Sophia Lamb's dialogue and the way she presented herself as a threat in each level of the game were the same as how Andrew Ryan did. Of course, there was no big twist when we finally meet her with another character taking the role of the antagonist, but the similarities in the presentation and feel of Ryan and Lamb were too obvious. In addition to this, the lack of a compelling connection of Eleanor Lamb to the player water down the urgency to save her. Yes, you die if you're not reunited with her, and yes, Sophia is planning to experiment with her in unethical ways, but there was no real bond between Subject Delta and Eleanor that made me really want to save her. I'll give the game somewhat of a pass here though since it was released in 2010. Now let's move on to the gameplay section. 
I know I said that Bioshock 2 didn't deviate much story-wise, and that sentiment stays the same with the gameplay. But this time, for good reason. Bioshock 1's gameplay was spot on, and here, they improved it in almost every aspect. First off, you're a big daddy. How awesome is that? Those hulking metal golems you used to fear in the first game? Yeah, you're one of them now. That's awesome from a gameplay perspective, but in the immersion and fear side, it falls short. You're a big daddy, what's there to fear? While you're still certainly killable, roaming the ruined city of Rapture feels way safer knowing I'm clad in an iron suit equipped with a giant drill instead of a monkey wrench. Gameplay stays largely the same, but where it differs the most is with the plasmid upgrades and tonics. In the first game, getting stronger versions of plasmids just increases their effectiveness, but now upgrading them means they get additional effects as well. Electrocution gains a chain lightning property, Incinerate lets you throw a firebomb, Winter Blast fully encases the target in a block of ice that when shattered, freezes nearby enemies, and so on. Tonics, on the other hand, have been freed from their distinctions. There are no more engineering, combat, and physical tonics. You can equip as many tonics as you want if you have the available slots. You can equip up to a total of 18 tonics at once. They also made it easier to unlock plasmid and tonic slots by reducing the amount of atom needed to unlock them. This way, it's easier to make a build since you're free to equip any gene tonic you discover. Now that we've mentioned atom, let's talk about how you get it. Instead of just taking the little sisters from Big Daddy's after killing them in the first game, you now have the option to adopt them, which you'll want to do if you want the good ending, after killing their guardians. When you adopt a little sister, you have them ride on your back while you find corpses which they can extract Adam from. While they gather Adam, you must defend them while waves of enemies attack you and try to disrupt the gathering process. Each sister can gather from corpses a total of two times. After that, you'll have to find a vent where you'll be given the option to rescue or harvest them like in the first game. And just like the first game, rescuing grants smaller amounts of atom but with big rewards every now and then, while harvesting grants max atom in addition to what you've gathered but kills the little sister in the process. Now here's where things get interesting. Early in the game, you're introduced to a new enemy type, the big sister. These are basically grown-up little sisters that were suited up for the purpose of rescuing little sisters whose big daddy has been killed by splicers. After rescuing, or harvesting, you freaking monster, a certain number of little sisters, a big sister will hunt you down. These fights are the hardest in the game as they combine the durability of a big daddy with the abilities of a Houdini and spider splicer. Beating a big sister will grant you even more atom and valuable resources. What's interesting about the AI of the big sister is that they seem to hate big daddies a lot. If you find a random big daddy wandering around while the big sister is on the hunt, stay near it and the big sister will actually attack it, making it an easy 2v1 as long as you don't chip the health of the big daddy as well. As far as enemy varieties go, everything from the first game is in here. Plus the addition of brute splicers, which are basically large muscular enemies that like to get up close and personal with you. Lucky for you, you have a drill perfect for that kind of situation. They're still hard to take down though. Another added enemy is the Rumbler, which is another variant of the Big Daddy. This one is equipped with a grenade launcher and throws automatic turrets to shoot you. And lastly, later in the game, you start fighting other Alpha series Big Daddies. But a few magazines of armor piercing around should be enough to take these big boys down. Bosses share the same design as the first game, which are key people in the world of Rapture that look exactly like splicers, but are just beefed up. The franchise yet again falls short in this aspect of the gameplay, but I think the game's focus was more with the immersion rather than having compelling boss fights. Having a quick look at the arsenal now, you've got your drill, rivet gun, remote hacking tool, gatling gun, shotgun, camera, spear gun, and your launcher. Instead of having two upgrades like in the first game, you now have three. To get the third, you must get the first two. The third upgrade always adds a significant effect to the weapon. Shotgun shells get an added electrocute effect, rivet gun consecutive shots burn enemies, machine gun bullets ricochet, and your drill can even reflect projectiles while spinning. I couldn't unlock all the third upgrades of all the weapons since the amount of weapon upgrade stations are limited, but I think the game was designed for you to not unlock everything in a single playthrough. This makes you think about spending Atom and which weapons to upgrade as these will be the ones to carry you in the late game. The first game also shared this design, but it felt much more obvious here compared to Bioshock 1. That being said, the game suffers significantly in the late game when you've upgraded your weapons and plasmids. You become too overpowered in my opinion, since even the big daddies melt like butter against a fully upgraded machine gun with anti-armor rounds. 
Lastly, for the gameplay section, I want to mention a few things I noticed in the game that weren't major but noticeable. There are underwater sections in the game, which were cool. Navigating the map was a little clunkier compared to Bioshock 1. I think the way they changed how the camera worked was a hassle, but the rewards for completing research milestones were way better. Hacking was also done better in this game, and lastly, you can no longer backtrack levels, making for a more linear experience. Now let's move on to the last section, replayability. Here is probably where Bioshock 2 falls tremendously short. I finished the game in a little over 16 hours, but I was AFK for probably an hour since I had to pause the game a lot due to life happening in the background. This game does have DLC, but most of them are more of cosmetic packs and changes to the multiplayer. Yes, this game does have a multiplayer mode, but I never tried it since I have no friends. One DLC does stand out that adds to the single player experience and it's called Minerva's Den. Again, I never got to try this, but what I do know is that it has its own story and doesn't add to the original storyline. Bioshock 2 falls very short in this aspect due to the absence of an NG Plus playthrough. If you wanted to play through the game with all the plasmids and weapon upgrades, you can't. I get that the game wasn't originally designed to have this built in, but I think the remastered version should have had it. I would have gone for another run, just to get all the things I never got in my first run. To me, the only reason to go for another playthrough is for the other endings or if you want to test out the other weapon upgrades or other plasmids, which doesn't sound appealing at all. Now it's time for us to answer the question, is Bioshock 2 Remastered worth playing in 2023? For me, it's not a good enough change from Bioshock 1 story-wise to really merit a playthrough. Is it a good game gameplay-wise? Yes. But the story, which is the franchise's bread and butter, feels reused here and too similar. It's a sequel, but it didn't add a lot to the story of Rapture and its characters, ultimately ending too similarly to the first game. Unfortunately, this game is indeed skippable. Thanks so much for watching up to this point. If you liked the video, leave a like and consider subscribing. I've got a long list of games to review so you wouldn't want to miss out on those. Let me know in the comment section below what you thought of the video. I'll be happy to have a discussion with you. If you also have a suggestion of what game I should review next, do mention it in the comment sections below too. Have a nice day and see you in the next video.